Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, today we're going to be working on lesson five, um, Photoshop 2020, classroom and a book. And uh, we'll be working with um, quick fixes in Photoshop. So um, the first one that we have is a before and after that is um, getting rid of red eye. And over the past iteration, several iter excuse me, iterations of Photoshop, um, they made several improvements to this tool. So again, th they don't tell you to do this, but I think it's just good practice. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this layer. So that I have work on a cop copy of it, not the original. And then I'm gonna zoom in here, see what I have. Yeah. There we go. You can see the red eye, it's created from a flash. So what I want to do is under the smart, um, this, I'm sorry, the spot healing brush tool at the very bottom is the red eye tool. Okay, and you'll notice that um, pupil size 50%, these are the default settings, darken amount 25%. So you want to make sure that you have the layer that you're working on selected and you just Click inside it. Ta da! Done. It's really amazing. It didn't remove the pupil, uh, you know, entirely. It left the little highlight um, created from the flash um, and it removed the red eye altogether. So let me do that one more time. Let's move over to her left eye. And again, move inside, click inside the red area. That's all you have to do and it's done. We're done with that. Very simple, just to let you know where that is. It used to be the case that there, they had a red eye tool, but it was didn't work really that well. Um, and there were like two or three popular workarounds that you'd have to go through that weren't as fast and as efficient, but would um, result, well, would get you better results. So I'm going to go ahead and close this one and, and I'm going to close this one and I'm not going to save it. So I can always go back and do it again. And so the next one, we, um, which is a fairly recent addition to Photoshop and it is the content aware fill. Um, it, depending on you know, what you're trying to remove um, in the surrounding area will determine, you know, the quality of the result. Um, so again, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna copy the background, Command J. There we go, turn off the background. And what I want to do is I want to select, for example, what we're doing is we're going to get rid of um, this rock over here in the left hand side and obviously associated with that rock we need to get rid of its reflection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a quick selection here and you can do that any number of ways we could use the lasso tool. Um, I'm going to use the polygonal lasso tool and I'm just going to you know loosely click around like so. Until I get the whole thing selected here. Okay. So once it's selected, the, uh, what I want to do now is to delete it. But if I just simply hit delete, then what happens is that I get the background color, which right now would be a transparent layer. So what I want to do is I want to go to my edit menu. And what I want to do is I want to select content aware fill. Okay. Hopefully I did that. Let me try again. Content aware fill. And another window will pop up with a before and after, show you um, what the result will look like with the current settings. And you can see that it, um, 
let's go ahead here and let's see what's going on. Now it's showing in the final result that this is still here and I don't get that. Let me go ahead here. I guess it's still going through the motions of trying to calculate. So as I said, my computer is running kind of slow. Um, you can see the little um, twirly thingy down here. It's going through its motions. And there you go. That's what it's going to look like. So I'm not entirely satisfied with that. So what I can do is I can take from that and we can um, either leave it as is, or I can decide from up here that, you know, the, the areas that are covered in this um, kind of mossy green are letting me know what parts it's using to make up the uh, a background for this that I want. So I don't want this area here, so I'm going to erase that. Um, I don't want this up here, so I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to get rid of all these areas up here. Um, I don't want the trees in here. Um, I don't want this. I don't want the rock. I just want parts of the that are going to take from the immediate area and see what results I get. Let's see if it makes a difference here. And if it doesn't, then this might just be the best result that I get. And then what I would have to do is I'd have to come back. And that's quite possible. Um, let me go ahead and erase a little bit more and see what I get. I can always add back to it if I so desire. And that took a little bit more from it. So that's not bad. So let me take a little more here. I'm going it as is. This, is. this is getting really, really close. If we look down in the pond itself, we can see that the, the fish remains, that the reflection is gone, that the rock is gone, but you can see where the rock overlapped the shoreline a little bit. Um, that we need to fix that and replace it. So I'm going to say, okay. Okay, and I'll just say, okay. And this is a non-destructive approach right now, which is really kind of nice. Because what it does is, is it will take the, um, the new area and it will place it when it's done going through the motions in a brand new layer that you can turn on and turn off. Okay, so it's going through the motions here. It's going to take a couple of seconds for it to finish. Yours should go quicker, again, because I'm talking to you online and I'm um, recording the video and everything. Um, it's taking a bit longer than usual. And I have a 3D rendering going on in the background. Anyway, you can see this here. If I turn this off, notice that it brings that selection back. And that's OK. So now I can deselect, OK? And I can combine these two layers to be able to work on them. So what I want to do to do that is I'm going to hold down the Shift key or the Command key, it doesn't matter, and make sure that I have both of these layers selected. And I want to collapse them together. But I want to keep these two original layers intact. So I'm going to hold down the shift key, the option key, or alt key, if you want to call it that, the command key um, could be the control key on the PC. And then I'm going to also hit the E key. So it's four keys that you hold down. And now what it does is it leaves the two original layers intact, which I can now turn off. And it combines them into a new layer. Now I can come back here and I can use the clone stamp tool or, you know, we can use um, the spot healing brush wouldn't help me at all, but the clone stamp would be a good one. And also I could also use, let's see what we have also we have here. Um, we could probably use the, try to use the patch tool as well and see how that works. So I would probably start with a clone stamp tool and I would rebuild some of these rocks here. 
And I would take some of these from these areas here and I would, you know, maybe use the clone stamp to build it into the edge here. And you can see though, that most of this has been replaced. So we're in good shape. So that's the next one. That's um, the content to wear fill. And that's a good one. Anytime you want to erase something from a background, it's always worth trying it and see what results you get. And if it gets you, you know, as we have close, um, but not entirely, um, you know, uh, where we want to be, that's okay because it still will take us less time to make the final repairs doing it this way. Okay, so there is the next one. So I'll take that one and I'll remove it. Come on, I'm gonna close it. And I don't wanna save that. So I keep my original intact for next semester. And this is what um, the finished one looks like. And you can see that they've left part of that there. That they haven't really retouched it yet. Um, the next one is the glass. So this is the end file. And you can see that we have, um, well, let's look at the start file. Well, let's look at the start file so you can see what's going on here. Whoops, there's the start file. And you can see that we have two layers here. Actually, this is the end file. So we, you can see we have two layers that have been created and two images that are layered on top of one another with layer masks. So that's the end file. If we look at the start file, let me click that. Come on, there we go. And if I turn one off and the other on, you can see that in one of them, in this one here, the glass, the glass is in focus, but the beach in the background is out of focus. So for those of you familiar with um, camera settings, this had a narrow, depth of field so that it kept the glass in focus, but then it put the, um, the background beach um, out of focus. If we look at the top layer, which is almost identical to it, you can see that now the glass is out of focus, but the beach is in focus. Well, if we want to create a composite image, and that would be up to you. I mean, maybe you want the glass in focus and the background out of focus, and that would be perfectly legitimate. But if you want an image now that has both of these in focus, then this is what you do. You have to first make sure that both of these photographs are aligned. Um, if you were had your camera on a tripod, it would probably be pretty darn close, but you would still want to do the following and make sure that both of these are in perfect, perfect alignment because maybe the, you know, the tripod or your camera or something had shifted a little bit, or if it were handheld, then it would be, you know, significant. So I'm going to go ahead and select both of these layers. And with both of them selected, then I go up to the edit menu. And what I want to do is I want to auto align layers. Okay. So what that does is it reads the information on both of the layers. I'm just going to leave auto settings. If I want, I can also remove vignette removal and geometric distortion. That would be okay. Um, you really don't need to do that for this. And it's going through the, the motions now and it's aligning those layers so that if you turn one off and the other on, and vice versa, um, they will be in perfect alignment with one another. So it's gonna take a couple of minutes to do that. Normally this goes very quickly. So that should be the case for you with your computer. Come on. And then once that's done, then we're, we're gonna use the next feature under the edit menu and we're going to select auto blend. And what that will do is it will automatically take and it will take, and it will, um, in an automatic feature, it will take the sharp focus areas and isolate them and combine them into one image. And it will, um, by creating layer masks for each of them. So it's taken a few minutes for this to do this. Like I said. It shouldn't take this long. I apologize. 
So on Monday, I will not have any renderings going in, that, in, my, in the background. And, but that still may not be any guarantee of speeding things up. Um, come on, come on, come on. Well, yeah, it's aligning them. There we go, maybe, there we go, aligning beach. So hopefully it won't take too, there we go, now it's speeding up. Why it's taking a while to do that, I don't know. Something happened here, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I didn't want that, I'm gonna undo that. I probably hit a couple of features that I shouldn't have, so let's try that again. Um, uh, I goofed. I'm gonna go auto align layers. And I'm gonna turn off vignette and turn off geometric distortions. That really messed things up, I think. So I'm gonna leave auto on. I thought that wouldn't be a problem. There we go, much quicker. So we're getting better results. So now they're auto aligned. And again, if I turn one layer off and leave the other on, notice that um, you just see the difference between the foregrounds and the backgrounds, that one is in focus and one is out of focus. Now with both of them selected, I'm ready to use the next feature that's autom automated. And I wanted to use the auto blend layers now. So what we're using are stacked images, not a panoramic one. And that will be another part of this lesson is to create you know, a single panoramic image from a number of stills. Um, and it does a pretty um, incredible job of that too. So these are stacked images that are already auto aligned. So it's blending the two together now. And it won't collapse them together, but it will create um, layer masks for each of them to create a, a finished version where both um, the background and the foreground are in focus now. Okay, I don't want to trim it. There we go. So we're good. Okay, so now it did combine them. Um, my mistake. And even when I turn that off, it did what I did. If it, it, using an automatic feature, it selected both layers and shift option command E, and then it blended those two layers, keeping these original ones intact, adding only um, adjustment layers, or not adjustment layers, but layer masks to each of them. Okay, so that's the next thing. And that's a nice automated feature. It works sometimes really well, and no, sometimes not so well, but yeah. So I don't wanna save that. And I don't wanna save in glass. I'm just closing both of those and gradually freeing up some memory here. There we go. So the next one, we have the Egret. And what we're going to do is sometimes you want to blur some areas and you want to leave other areas um, intact. So if we look at the end file here, <clears throat> we can see that an ellipse has been created and that the egret is in fact in focus, but the surrounding area is blurred. So what we wanna do is we wanna you know, focus certain areas and blur other areas. The whole image right now is in focus. So, so to change that, what we're going to do is we're going to go to filter. And I'm not copying my layer, I'm, you know, because and what I wanna do is I wanna go through the blur gallery and we're going to use iris blur, okay? And what that does is it will pop out a little um, ellipse. There we go. So let's see, um, there we go. So you can see <clears throat> that I have this ellipse that I can now move up and move it anywhere on this composition. Um, I can make it a little bit narrower because maybe, I, again, I just want the, the 
egret to be the part that's in focus. So I'm changing the parameters of this ellipse, you know, the overall size of it, and that looks pretty good. And then I want to change the inner part because notice that it goes from blur or very blurry image on the outside and then gradually transitions on the inside of that ring from a blur to a sharp image. And I can control that by moving these little points here. So I'm going to go ahead and move that back a little bit. And then to control the amount of blur itself, there is this little ring in the center and if I want, I can dial it back so it's a little bit maybe less blurred. Or if I spin it around all the way to the other end, it is very blurred. So depending on the effect that you're going for, you can control that blur. So for me, this is adequate. This is a permanent change. So it would have been better for me to go ahead and copy that layer instead. And now that I'm done with it, I can go ahead and I can click OK because filters are by nature um, destructive. There are workarounds for that. And as I said, one of them would have been to copy my background layer. The only way that I have to go back to that background layer now is to hit Command Z to undo that change. Okay. Um, we could turn this layer into a smart object and that would make the, um, the blur um, an editable feature and non-destructive, but we'll get to that in later lessons. So that's the iris blur. You should check out some of the other blur features that are really quite nice um, to use in substitution. You know, if you have a, a, a really nice image that you chose not to um, have a narrow depth of field and you wanted to isolate some areas and make some areas out of focus and keep other areas in focus to control where the viewer looks, um, then this would be one of the you know, useful tools to do that. So there's another quick one for us. So I'll turn that one off. I don't want to save it. And there's the other one. And I'm going to close that. That's the finished version. So the next one. Um, lens distortion. And you can see here's the start file. And you can see that, you know, when you get really close to certain particular, you know, architectural, um, you know, uh, objects and your field of vision, that there will be a certain amount of lens distortion that occurs. And what we want to do is we want to get rid of most of that. And you can see that it kind of stretches it out. And it's not altogether been removed, but most of it has been removed. And again, a very nice automatic feature that's available to us. So what we want to do, and I think in this case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit Command J to make a copy of that layer. And I'm going to turn the background layer off um, because I failed not to do that before. And I'm going to go to Filter. And what I want to do is I want to go to Lens. Um, let's see, where do I want to go? I want to go to lens correction. I'm just going to go there. And a little dialog box should pop up, should take me to really kind of like an ancillary program. So I'm going to use auto scale image, make sure that that's turned on. Instead of auto correcting, I'm going to use custom. And now what I want to do using the very top slider here is I want to remove the distortion. And as I slide this to the right, it will automatically enlarge the image because in order to correct for some of this, notice that it's straightening the columns as I move it to the right. Um, but it will um, cause, if I don't turn on um, the automatic scaling, it will uh, leave holes in the corners. So we can go in this particular image almost all the way to 100%. You can also vignette the image if you wish. You can darken it. You can transform a vertical or horizontal perspective as well. And that might be fun for you to play with. I'm just going to move this all the way to 100%. Let's see what I have here. 
And that looks like a pretty good choice. Okay. And you can see in the lower left hand corner, it was updating my file. So that's it. That's all you have to do. Again, if you want to play with some of the other features, you know, here's vertical distortion, you know, that you can change. And I don't want to change this. It's kind of sluggish. My computer is really sluggish. Horizontal, which is kind of fun. You can see that it tilts it in different directions. So if you want to compensate for vertical or horizontal distortions, you can do that as well. Um, the one that I just use is probably the most common one um, with lens distortion. And when you're done and when you're happy with it, you just click OK. And that's it. But as I said, if I didn't, if I hadn't used, um, it's going through the motions now to, to finish the image. And you can see then when we turn on and off, but if I turn off the background and we go back and forth between the two, you can see that there's considerable lens distortion has been fixed. If you want to go for the distortion for some sort of aesthetic reason, leave it. If not, you have these, uh, these automated tools that allow you to fix some of it, not all of it, but most of it. Okay, so that's the next one. Um, the next one is perspective distort. And this is, um, I don't want to save that. So I'm closing my images here and leaving the train. So here's our start file. You can see that we're combining an image of a train with um, a nice um, background image with train tracks, but you can see that the perspective of the train doesn't match the, the tracks. So that's what we want to do is we want to correct for that. And we just can't simply rotate it. That doesn't work for us. So if we look at the finished version that they have for us, and we can see how that looks, you can see how the train now rests nicely on the tracks. Okay, and the perspective of the train matches the perspective of the railroad tracks. So that's what we want to do. We're going to go back to the original one. And you can see that they have two images for us. We have the train on one layer, and you do need to have your um, the object that you want to affect on one layer, and you want the background to be on a separate layer. So with the train layer selected, I'm going to go to edit. And what I want to do is I want to use perspective warp. And we have, this is a two-step process. What I want to do is I first want to pick um, the, uh, the layout for this. So I'm going to click and drag like so. And I'm trying to find and match the perspective of the train. So maybe I need to use the wheels of the train here. And I also want to match the vertical so of the train. So I'm finding, um, actually, I could probably use in the caboose. I could go ahead and I could move this up to match the perspective of the wheels. And I want to match the perspective of the vertical on the, um, the caboose. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull this down like so, because I want to match the perspective There we go, of the rest of the train here. And now when I'm ready to move this into position, and if I'm happy with it, now I select warp. And when I do that, now what I can do is I can, I wanna close that. I don't need instructions how to do that. I can now move this into position and I'm gonna move the back set of wheels so that they now, you can see it's still, it's really warping it quite a bit, but I wanna get the back wheels to match 
the train. And now I can move the back of this to fit like so. And I can move the front wheels of the, the train up a little bit so that they match like so. And I can move this down. So it's allowing me to warp this and to get it to, you know, to fine tune this and to fit it so that it fits the, and we get both photographs to match one another now. And again, I think I'm pretty close. Move that up just a little bit. I'm having a hard time seeing today too. So now that both of them are pretty close, if I'm happy with it, I can click the little checkbox and let's see how close I got. And if I'm not happy with it, then just hit Command Z, undo, and do it again. And that's a pretty close match for right now. You can see that the train wheels now fit on the track and we still have, we have a matching perspective. So that works pretty nicely, okay? So there's one more feature that we want to cover now. And that will be it for today. Okay, And that is to create a panoramic view. So I'm going to close both of these. I don't want them anymore. So that was the perspective warp. I don't want to save that. And that was a two-step process. And you need to make sure that whatever you want to warp is on a separate layer. So we'll close this one. So what I want to do now is I have a collection of photographs that are available for you in Lesson 5 in a separate folder. So what I want to do is I want to go to File. Oh, come on. There we go. And I want to go to Automate. And what I want to do is I want to do a photo merge. That's under File, Automate, Photo Merge. It will bring up another little dialog box for me in a minute. And if you have your images saved and isolated in a separate folder, then that's all you need to do. So what I want to do is I'm going to, I will go ahead and I'm going to click Vignette Removal, Geometric Distortion Removal, in contact to where can to where fill transparent area, and now I need to to browse the area that are um, in the folder in lesson five. So I'm going to go to my desktop, and I need to go to. I don't want to go to there. I need to go to Photoshop. Find out where my images are. And there's Photoshop 2020 lessons. And I need to select lessons five. And contained in lesson five is um, files for panorama. So now I can select this folder with these four images, skyline one through four. And you can use more than four images. The thing that's nice about this is that the images that are here can be from a, a handheld camera. And only the thing that you need to make sure of when you um, are shooting the original images that you want to blend together in a panoramic view is to make sure that there's adequate overlap between those so that it can detect where that overlap is and where it needs to make the corrections. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select those four images now. Okay. And it should pop up here in the middle. There we go. We have these four. So now I can click OK. Okay. Now these are the four images that I want. And I'm just going to leave the auto settings rather than use perspective or cylindrical or anything else. But in this particular instance where I goofed on the um, the auto align and merge vertically, you do want blend images together. You do want to remove the vignetting, which is the darkened area that occurs in the corners of a photograph. You know, typically when you're taking um, 
uh, landscape photos, but not in every case. It could be a close up of an image, but you know, the dark, the corners of a photograph darken. Um, it's going to remove that. And if there is any geometric distortion, it's going to attempt to correct for that. And then if there are any gaps that are left over, it will use um, content aware fill for those transparent areas. So let's see what we get. Take a minute. That's going to go through the motions and it does its magic. And lo and behold, in a few minutes, we're going to have um, a nicely stitched together um, image. And you'll see that it, it, it ends with a composite layer, but beneath that are the four images that we selected with um, layer masks showing where they have, you know, fixed that. So let's go back here. How white, there we go. So it's going through the motions now. And it's taken all of them. So these were the, the four separate images and now it's gonna stitch them all together into one final image. And now it's, you know, blending the content together. It's pretty amazing how, how it all works. Now, most of you have, um, you know, if you have a smartphone, it has um, uh, this feature on the phone that allows you to create a panoramic view. Um, but this works equally well. Um, you can probably, in some cases, create a better image this way. And there you go. Now, there's are the, the empty areas that it's created you know, when in stitching them together. Now it's gonna fill those areas with content aware fill. And it will do a pretty darn good job of that in just a couple of seconds here. There's only one more thing that we need to fix when we're done with this. And that is to crop it because you'll notice that the horizon is slightly tilted. And that's kind of a minor change. All we have to do is use the crop tool, auto align, you know, um, you know, align it and we'll be good to go. Um, as you can see, that there's, you know, a lot of tilting and a lot of distortion that would have occurred because the, the original images were from uh, uh, taken with a camera that were <clears throat> handheld, it wasn't on a tripod where they just simply, you know, um, pivoted the, the camera. So it's taking, it's filling it now trying to gather the information that it needs to fill those blank areas. If you don't need, need it, you could have, you know, we could have left that turned off. But I think um, I wanted to show all of you, you know, the magic that it performs when you do have those last features checked off. Okay. And you can see already as it's working the final steps of this down here in the layers panel, that these are the four images. And these are the layer masks that it's created for each of these in order to have that overlap and the strip stitch together um, occur. Well, we're a little over halfway through with that stitching. Take just a couple of more minutes. There you go. Pretty nice job. So we can deselect. Okay, Command D to deselect that area. Whoops, I didn't want to save it just yet. Command, yeah, there we go. Deselect. And you can see here it's not a perfect stitch job here, and there's not a perfect one here. So you might still have to use clone. Um, stamp tool to build some of those areas. Um, but overall, not bad, not bad at all. I mean, I, I could also take from over here and I could copy it and flip it, and bring it over here. But it took those four images and, you know, uh, blended them together quite nicely. So as I said, you know, if we use the crop tool, 
And what I want to do is I don't want to crop it that way. But um, anyway, you get the idea. If we use, we want to straighten it, you know, and we can go ahead, let's straighten the image. If I click from here and I drag across to here, like so, that would allow me to crop it. And then I have this set for something else that I don't want to change. But that, you know, would be the last step that you would need to do. Okay, so I'm going to turn that off and leave it as is, but just the default settings here that were used. So that's it. Those are all the quick fixes covered in lesson five that shouldn't take you long at all. In fact, they should take you less time than when it took me today, since we are, um, what, using maybe 40 minutes or so of this, it should take you maybe a half an hour tops. As I said, because I have other things going on because I'm recording this and, um, you know, I'm really taxing my computer right now. And so it's slowing everything down. So that's it. If there aren't any questions, um, we're good. Um, do you have any questions for me before? I'm going to go ahead and um, pause the recording and see if you have questions about your, your postcard assignment. Um, it will probably be due in about three weeks or so. And while we're, you know, you're working on that, we're going to continue to work on lessons. We'll probably take a little bit more time for the lessons than I've taken for these, but I've tried to work on a lesson a day to get you up to speed so that you can begin to work on some interesting projects. So let me go ahead and pause this. So I'm resuming recording. So here we go. Um, let me repeat just the last part of this. Um, again, you, Natalie, you wanted to know how to blur just, um, you know, part of an object. Well, I have my dog Bagel on, isolated on her own layer. I went to layer up here. And um, under the layer menu, if I can get this to work. Come on. I want to um, create under smart objects, convert to smart object. And as soon as I've done that, you can see that it changes it down here, allowing me to add smart filters. And now what I did is that I went up to the filter layer and I applied um, Gaussian blur to it. I don't want to open any files. Uh, my computer, because it's so sluggish, is doing weird things. So watch when I turn Gaussian blur back on and it keeps it as a separate smart filter. So now when I go to filters and I go to blur, come on, blur, Gaussian blur, it will, um, and apply it, it will be, you know, viewed here. Now I can go ahead and I can turn that back on. So I'll turn Gaussian blur back on and you can see that just bagel has been blurred, but the rest of the scene is um, intact and, you know, nice, crisp and in sharp focus. Okay, so let's see a new message here. Can you define smart object again? Yeah. You, you select a layer and that would, for you, that would, um, it has to be, it can be any layer, but typically it will be part of a layer that has um, uh, a, one object on it or a couple of objects. And then what you do is that you go up to layer. And you come down here and under smart objects, you say convert to smart object. That's how you define that layer as a smart object. And then that will enable you to apply filters and edit those filters at a later time. So you're working non-destructively. 
is, as I said, I can turn off Gaussian blur on that layer and it brings it back to its original state. And if I want to turn this back into a bitmap rather than a smart object, I can always go back to layer and I can rasterize the layer when I'm done. So I go back to smart objects or go to rasterize now. I say that I want to rasterize the layer or rasterize the smart object. So, and then you, it just takes you back to where you were, but it leaves whatever filter that you've applied to it intact so that we'll turn it back into a, a permanent change. Okay. So are we good for today? Now that we're run up to the, any more questions? No? Okay. Well then, um, I will say goodbye for now. Okay, and you guys are free to leave. And I will see everybody Monday. Monday we'll probably be working on a new lesson. Um, and we'll, we'll get done with the lessons, you know, probably by midterm, maybe a little bit afterwards. And then I'll have another series of videos for us to watch that will, you know, help us out. Okay. So um, that's it. <clears throat> I'm going to say goodbye and I'm going to pause my recording and it will be available soon. <laughs>